Denise Tsakuze Skaze, Madam Speaker, we stand here today at a historic moment when trains across this country are at a standstill, when critical infrastructure is being blocked, when Canadians are so concerned about what is going on, and when Indigenous people across this country are wondering what it is that this Prime Minister means when he says the words reconciliation, when he says that there is no relationship more important than that with Indigenous people. The riding that I represent, Skeeto Bulkley Valley, has been living this issue for years now. It is a difficult one for many people, and for no people more so than the Wet'suwet'en. I asked Sue Alfred if I could share her story, and she gave me that permission. Sue carries the hereditary Wet'suwet'en name Willat. She's 80 years old, and she lives in the community of Witset, just west of Smithers. Peter Michelle and Annie Tiljo were her grandparents. In 1914, her mother was one year old, one of seven children, and her grandparents lived at a place called Misty Falls near the community of Houston, where they had a homestead. They were living there on land that the Wet'suwet'en had occupied for millennia, and one day in 1914, the RCMP came to her property with the Indian agent and told her grandparents that they had to move along. And they packed their things and they walked dozens of miles to an area near Smithers called Glentana. And they tried again to establish a home there. And what happened? The same people showed up, the RCMP and the Indian agent, and told them that they had to move along. And so they did. And they moved to another place on the Telqua High Road near the community of Whitset and made their home there. Sue tells me that her, she remembers her grandmother crying as she told her the story of displacement. And so you can understand, Madam Speaker, why the police action we have seen in recent days and weeks on Wet'suwet'en territory is so troubling to so many people who call that place home. And it is why further police action threatens to undermine any chance of real reconciliation. In the Northwest, we have been having the difficult conversations around reconciliation and resource development and respect for Indigenous rights for years. As communities, we have started to face the difficult colonial history that has held back our relationship with Indigenous peoples, and we have begun to work on how we can work together to be better stewards of the lands and waters and create a future for our children. In my hometown of Smithers, we sat down with the Wet'suwet'en chiefs and they told us, and elders, and they told us their stories. And we worked with them, municipal government and the hereditary government, to tell the difficult stories about our community's past. It's one of the first steps on moving forward together. Across the region that I represent, courageous Indigenous people have been working for years to gain recognition and respect on their own lands. Some, like the Niska people, succeeded in achieving British Columbia's first modern treaty, a treaty that set out a path for self-government and was signed in 1998. <laughs> At the same time, it was the hereditary leaders of the Gitsan and the Wet'suwet'en who went to court to establish and affirm their rights, to have them affirmed by the court in the, the Delgamuk Gisteway court case, which they fought for 20 years against the Crown, which for all that time maintained a policy of denial, denied them their rights, denied them their stories. They fought it all the way to the Supreme Court, where on appeal, their rights were affirmed, and the judge said that their stories did matter, and that they did have rights on that land. The Supreme Court ruled that their title to the land in Northwest British Columbia that they've occupied for thousands of years remains unextinguished. We have landed at a place where the only way out of this crisis is through dialogue. It is through understanding and it is through humility. It is through true nation to nation talks. And I'm very pleased to see that those talks are starting no matter how late in the game they are coming. They're very important. They're of utmost importance. And I want to commend the Minister for Indigenous Services for the respect 
and dignity that he has brought over recent days to those conversations. But we also need to ask ourselves whether we could have foreseen this. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs are the same group that fought that Delgamut court case all the way to the Supreme Court against the government's policy of denial and established a precedent for Indigenous groups across the country. The court recognized their standing and they set a precedent. In that ruling, the judge directed the federal government that it had, quote, a moral if not legal duty to enter into and conduct negotiations in good faith on the question of their Indigenous title. Yet over 20 years since that historic ruling, successive liberal and conservative governments have failed to step up and begin the difficult work of upholding and acknowledging and affirming Wet'suwet'en title. There has been so much said in recent days about what percentage of people support what. And my fear is that this only serves to further deepen the divides that have been created. The assertions made today by the leader of the official opposition very much fall into this category, suggesting that this project, Coastal Gas Link, has majority support by one group or another group. The reality is, is that the hereditary chiefs represent a legitimate decision-making body for Indigenous people outside of reserves. The court has said so. I was at the Batlats, the feast in Witset where the chiefs ratified their non-consent for this pipeline. This came after they had recommended and suggested alternative routes which were rejected by the company. Throughout all of this, where was the federal government? Where was the prime minister and his commitment to reconciliation? The reality is that we talk about changing our relationship with indigenous people and yet what, what we see is a reluctance to change anything about the status quo and the way that we do business. And as the blockades have shown, that's just not going to fly. We have landed in a predicament that can't be fixed by police action. If it could have, it would have been fixed in January 2019, when the police arrested and removed 14 people from the Maurice Forest Service Road. Or it would have been fixed last month, when they did the same thing again. The images of RCMP tactical teams putting rifles at unarmed Wet'suwet'en and Gitsan people, images of indigenous people being dragged over the very land their ancestors once walked, the vicious, racist social media commentary that we have seen online in recent days and weeks, and so much more, has sparked a solidarity movement the likes of which our country has never seen. And so we find ourselves where we are today, when people across the country are blocking the infrastructure that Canadians need in their daily lives for the services they rely on and the products that our lifestyle relies on. We can discount the voices of the people blockading as fringe radicals or anarchists. We can choose to discount those voices or we can listen closely to what Indigenous people on those blockades are saying. And if we listen closely, what we, are what we can hear is that there is too much of a gap between what the government says about Indigenous people and its actions. Do we actually grasp the gravity of a situation in which young Indigenous people are telling us that reconciliation is dead? I'm not sure that we do. As I said before, this issue is a very difficult one for Northwest BC communities. There are indeed Indigenous groups in the riding I represent who support this project and who stand to benefit from it. I spoke today with Crystal Smith, the Chief Counselor of the Heisla Nation, and she told me about the educational and employment opportunities that people in her community are already experiencing. These voices are important too. We cannot ignore these voices. But ultimately, the only way out of this is through nation-to-nation -nation talks, through dialogue and with humility. And the problem is that this government keeps talking about doing different di things differently without being willing to change the status quo one iota. Sue Alfred's late husband was Wataket Henry Alfred, who was the last living plaintiff in the Delgamuka Stayway court case. Her daughter is Dolores Alfred, who teaches the Wet'suwet'en language and culture in Smithers. 
and her grandson is Rob Alfred, who opposes the pipeline. The story of her family, the story of displacement, of being denied a voice, being denied fundamental rights, is the story of so many Indigenous people. And it's time to write a new story, and that starts with this Prime Minister sitting down with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs and hearing their stories. Awatsa, Masai.